Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, subscribing to your critical data supply chain, getting value from true data lineage, sponsored today by ASG. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. Or would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Today we have two speakers joining us, Stuart Bond, the Research Director of IDC's Data Integration Software Service, and Sue Havas, VP of Product Manager at ASG. Before joining IDC, Stuart worked as an architect, consultant, and analyst in information management and middleware markets for 25 years. He spent 10 of those years at IBM and most recently was an analyst with Infotech Research Group in Canada. Stuart holds an honors diploma in transportation engineering technology from Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario. Ontario. Sue has over 18 years experience working with metadata on the buy side as a uh, customers and sell side as a vendor, including implementation, showcasing, and program support. She has supported a wide range of clients, including financial, insurance, healthcare, manufacturing, and e-commerce, with a general need to provide data-driven business practices. Sue is responsible for launching and guiding ASG's Enterprise Data Intelligence Solutions, Superior, superior Metadata, Data Governance Technology, and fresh modern offerings that deliver excellent value for today's challenging business demands. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over over to Stuart to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi Shannon, thank you very much for having me today and thank you very much to Dataversity for, for running this webinar uh, on behalf of ASG. Uh, so as, as uh, Shannon mentioned, I'm research director focused on data integration software at IDC. We follow the software markets and we keep an eye on what's going on. and. Uh, Talk to a lot of end users that are using the software to get a to get an idea of how they're using it and their needs and their their desires and uh, and feed that information back. So uh, today we're going to talk about just getting value out of a true data lineage and through the data supply chain. You know, in the 25 years I've been in the industry, data quality, integrity, and data lineage has always been a problem, and I'm sure it was a problem long before I even started. In my experiences from programming through to solutions architecture and now as an industry analyst, the problem of data integrity never went away. It really just got worse as data environments got more complicated. As organizations deal with increasingly complex data environments and digital transformation, of course, is top of mind these days, data integrity is even more important now than it's ever been before. Today we're going to look at the issue of data integrity, specifically focused on data lineage in the age of digital transformation. As we follow the supply chain, the, sorry, the data supply chain, understand the value it can provide, and look at the features in an emerging software market segment that we're seeing and understanding becoming known as what's being called data intelligence. Data really is core to digital transformation. Intelligence over that data is critical to understanding the integrity of the data. Today's data environment today is more complex than it's ever been before. Where we used to have finite data sets with predictable growth, we now have seemingly unlimited data sets with exponential growth. Where we used to store text and numbers in one or two data technologies and formats, we now have many big data, relational, NoSQL, image, video, text, audio formats, and, and uh, technologies to put that data in. Where we used to have databases that could enforce schema, we now have schemaless repositories. Data needs to be available. I did some work with a logistics company not too long ago that uh, had so much data that they couldn't physically move it around every night so that every data center in the world had a, an exact copy and replica of that data that they needed to do their business. So we did some work with them to figure out how they could potentially uh, have that data available to the people that needed it when they needed it without having to replicate it and move it around every night. Data needs to be secure. We know that the perimeter is gone. 
Uh, there's too many examples of data breaches in, in the economy today and in the reports we hear in the news. Data needs to be compliant. In today's global economy with data being stored and accessed around the world, it needs to be compliant with multiple regulations, not only where it's being stored, but also where it's being used. Data needs to be trusted. Organizations need to know how dirty their data is or how clean it is, depending on whether you're a glass half empty or half full type, full type of person. You need to use it appropriately. You need to know where it came from. If you don't know the lineage of your data, you don't know whether you can trust it. The scale of data distribution and the variation of data sources and types on the third platform is greater than ever before. The third platform, you see a diagram of it here on the right of the slide, is a, is a concept that IDC's come up with. It's really talking about where most of the IT spend is today and where all of the digital transformation solutions are being implemented. It's made up of four pillars, cloud, big data and analytics, social, and mobile. On top of that, there's a number of innovation accelerators, whether it's next-gen security, augmented reality, Internet of Things, cognitive systems, robotics, uh, 3D printing, that, that are really enabling some of the new business models and the digital transformation that's occurring. When you look at this, you realize that data integrity is going to be key to the success of these digital transformation initiatives. And data intelligence is going to be critical to understanding the level of integrity. Metadata management solutions and data lineage solutions are really have become the cornerstones of what we're seeing in these emerging data intelligence solutions. We're expanding the definition of lineage from where and how to answer all five W's of data. There we go. <laughs> so, Let's take a look here at some initiatives that are occurring today and how data integrity is impacting them. We ran a survey in the fall of 2015 of about 650 uh, data integration software end users. And at the top of the list here in terms of uh, issues that are already impacting digital initiatives, security and compliance policies uh, were made the top of the list. And I don't think that's a huge surprise because when we're talking about the third platform, we're talking about cloud and such, um, th those issues come up all the time. But if you recognize it says policies, policy constraints, and I, and from, from what we've seen, I think it's more because the policies can't keep up with the technology. We've all heard about how cloud data centers can be more secure than on-premise data centers. Uh, we also understand that there are compliance policies that can prevent one department or one group from seeing another group's data. There's a lot of examples of that in healthcare. Budget constraints came in second. Not a surprise as everyone seems to have this common concern or issue. But if you notice data constraints came in third, ahead of technology, human resource, and even poorly defined requirements. And, and that was a little surprising, not completely surprising given how much I'm focused on data. But it was surprising because I know when I was a consultant, it seemed like requirements always changed and the business always complained about IT not understanding the requirements and people not getting it right. The bottom line here is that digital transformation is happening now and data, which is at the core of digital transformation, is already impacting these initiatives. We suspect the data without integrity won't be able to support those initiatives moving forward. So let's take a little bit closer look at data integrity on the third platform. In the survey, we, uh, we, we asked about organizations where they were storing their data that was being integrated. And while this chart is up and I'm discussing it, I'm gonna get Shannon to launch a poll here because we wanna get a better understanding of where the group that's listening to this webinar today is where are you storing the data that you are integrating? Are you storing it on-premise only? Do you have a hybrid environment? Or are you storing data in the cloud only? So then go ahead and answer that poll for the next minute and then we'll discuss the results. So as you can see from the chart here, it illustrates that there were more respondents 
in the population of, of the survey uh, people that are storing, they're integrating data in hybrid and cloud-only environments. They're those that are integrating on-premise only. You know, the for rent sign is up there because we talk about access trumping ownership in the age of digital transformation. And it's not just limited to IT, right? It's, it's uh, you know, talk about Uber and ride sharing, cars and car to go, bicycles in many urban centers, living spaces through Airbnb and so on. It is becoming more distributed and lineage will be harder to track across multiple clouds. Master data is at the highest risk of data integrity issues. It's master data is the data about the people, places, and things that your organization cares about. And it's that data that gets, gets distributed the most into the cloudy environments. You think about going into CRM systems and HR systems and payroll systems and ERP systems, it's the master data that is being distributed the most. And really the number of on-premises only data environments are gonna to continue to, de to decrease as companies pursuing digital transformation initiatives without a cloud IT foundation will be utterly impossible. So Shannon, is the poll done? Yep, send it. It is, you should be get... right now. It looks uh, like most on-premise only. On-premise only, okay. I'm not seeing the results, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, so it looks like 25% say on-premise only, 22% say hybrid, and 2% say cloud only. Okay, so we're about half and half between uh, everyone that's on the line, okay? So, you know, although our survey results showed that it's increasing in the cloudy environments, uh, you know, we suspect that, that trend is going to continue. So what happens when data gets to the cloud? Well. Data becomes harder to trust. Uh, the survey results, we, we asked those organizations, we asked organizations who, was, who has, was measuring data quality metrics. So measuring how many duplicates they had, the completeness of their data, how much conflicting data, the staleness or timeliness of their data. And, and we then did a cross-reference of all of those organizations that were integrating data in these three categories of environments. Of those that were measuring data quality metrics, they experienced less positive and more negative changes in the measurements in hybrid and cloudy environments. So let's take a closer look at that. So looking at you know, on-premises, again, the, the, num the, the negative, there's fewer organizations that have negative measurements there, but you can see the trend as moving to hybrid and then to cloud. The, the amount of negative gets larger, the amount of positive gets smaller. And really when you think about this, it really it, it, it's an intersection of two pillars of the third platform that are driving digital transformation. It's cloud, cloud platforms, and data, big data and analytics. You might even call this the perfect storm if you're trying to get more value out of data in your environment. There we go. So let's take a closer look at data lineage. Historically, it's been traced in two dimensions of types, where and how lineage. And this is my feeble attempt at drawing a lineage diagram. ASG does a much better job of doing these, by the way. <laughs> um, where lineage traces the origin of the data, how lineage traces how the data source was manipulated or changed to produce the outcome. And so if you think about the data supply chain, data coming from somewhere going to a target. Lineage is a, is a significant part of that supply chain. So in this example here, we're looking at uh, vendor data and invoice data going through to a spend report. So in the instance of, of where lineage, we're gonna take a look at schema and instance. So schema where lineage in this example shows that the spend data came from the vendor in the invoices table. The schema level how lineage in this example documents the selection, summarization, and grouping that produce these results. You can then go down to a finer grain of instance lineage 
to look at specific data values for one vendor and all their related invoices, and potentially even tracing that back to the invoices themselves. So that just gives you an idea. Traditionally, this is how we've looked at lineage, considered lineage, but really in the complex environment that we have today of the third platform and the complexity of all the different new data types that we have, need for better data intelligence is really upon us. It's driving new requirements and expanding the definition and the type of metadata that's being captured. Again, I mentioned this earlier, we're now talking about the five W's of data, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. So who is using it? What does it mean? Not just, um, you know, not just um, what is it, but what does it mean? Where did it come from, traditionally, where lineage, but also where is it in the organization? Where is it being physically stored, persisted for access? When was it captured? And when is it being used? So looking both at the backward and forward lineage, but from a when, from a timing perspective. Why is it being stored? And why is it being used? How has it changed? How is it being used? And how is it related? Relationships bring a new dimension to metadata and lineage. And all of these questions together are bringing context to the data, giving organizations a higher level of trust in the data that they have in their organization. Hence, providing a lot more intelligence about the integrity of the data. I mentioned how important relationships are becoming. Relations now need to, relationships now need to be better understood. No longer is just a 360 degree view of master data important, but relationships between people, products, services, and processes all need to be understood internally within your organization, externally between each other outside of the organization, and understanding how those relationships traverse the walls between the internal and the external. And an understanding of these relationships will need to happen at scale in the age of digital transformation. Let's look at customer intimacy as an example. IDC has predicted that customer intimacy is going to happen at scale. And intimacy at scale may seem a little bit paradoxical, but leaders in digital transformation have demonstrated an ability to do this. Think about personalizing interactions and offerings to millions of customers through their ability to harvest insights from relationships, activities, and preferences. Consider shopping on Amazon or offers that are pushed to your email or browser or show up in your Facebook feed and they're related to your favorite hobby or pastime. It's been said that it can take years to gain a loyal customer and seconds to lose them. In the age of digital conversations in digital transformation, data quality and integrity is going to have a significant impact on customer loyalty because poor data quality and integrity can result in turning a customer away pretty quickly. So I think we're just sort of scratching the surface of the value that data lineage can bring to an organization. Here's some categories of patterns of data lineage that are delivering value that we uncovered through some research that we did. Governance, so providing backward lineage of data to trace results of reports and such back to data owners, back to the sources for quality assurance and access control. In addition to providing forward lineage that allows the data owners and stewards to manage the use of their data and understand how it's being used. In compliance, providing evidence to regulatory bodies on where the data came from, who's using it and how it's been changed throughout its life cycle. Change management, allowing users and developers to understand how data element change will impact downstream systems and reports. In solution development, allowing better design, testing, and higher quality deliverables by sharing lineage, glossary, and relationship metadata across distributed development teams. Storage optimization, providing insights into 
what data is being accessed, where it is in the organization, where it is in the IT environment, how often and who is accessing it. This data is being used for data archiving decisions and disposition decisions. Data quality, improving the quality scores that are calculated through the application of business and standardization rules against the data and the lineage itself. Understanding how clean or dirty your data is through these scores can make for better decision making and better outcomes. And problem resolution, assisting with root cause analysis and break fix issues. And really, I think a wider business level benefit of lineage also exists. Focusing on changed values but some of the core master data entities that I referred to earlier. These data entities that are shared among processes, departments, and applications. An example could be marketing sales or service impact of a contact's change of title, department, address, or even employer. The ability to capture, validate, and distribute and trace these changes in a timely manner could lead to better protection of legacy revenue streams and the ability to capitalize on new revenue in business-to-consumer and business-to-business -business commercial relationships. Not, not knowing about a change could result in losing credibility or losing a relationship with a, with a customer that you've had for a long time. Knowing about that change uh, and, and being involved with that customer through that change could certainly go a long way to uh, protecting that revenue and perhaps even increasing it. So enough about anecdotal evidence. Let's look at some quantitative information. What's measured can't be improved is a favorite quote that I've heard. And so we asked our survey respondents about measuring data integrity metrics. I referred to this a little bit earlier. Within the population of respondents that had implemented data lineage management, 90% had also reported seeing tangible benefits. With almost all of the reporting benefits within the first year of implementation. This chart illustrates the difference between the number of respondents that have reported positive data quality measurements and have implemented the process of data line of lineage management compared to the number of respondents that have also reported positive measurements but are not doing lineage management. We can see here in the numbers and in the bar chart that it, data lineage is having an a very positive impact on reducing the amount of data duplication, reducing the number of data conflicts, improving the timeliness or reducing the staleness of data. And based on these results, we can only hypothesize the data lineage doesn't have a positive impact on whether or not data sets are complete. We also measured the impact of lineage on availability, security, and compliance. And these yielded similar results. While I walk through the data on the chart, again, we're gonna have Shannon throw up another polling question. Is your organization tracing lineage? And if yes, are you using it with an automated tool? So are you, do you have an automated tool for tracking lineage? So yes, you're tracing it, it's automated. Yes, it's manual. No, you're not tracing data lineage. So as you, as you can see by the numbers here, there is some positive impact on reducing the time to find data, but you can see that there's a significant impact on reducing the amount of time to prepare data for presentation, almost by a factor of more, a factor of two at least, um, getting towards three. There may or may not be an impact on security as the data suggests. But lineage, <clears throat> sorry, just, <laughs> but lineage does appear to be having a positive impact on compliance, as suspected, in that this is a key value proposition of lineage and metadata management. Oh, they're now I'm seeing the uh, poll results. So it looks like we've got um, we've got a few people with an automated solution, more with manual. And then we've got a bunch that aren't measuring and uh, and uh, majority, well, a little bit, not quite the majority, no answer, okay? Well, that's interesting. Okay. 
So let's look at some case studies based on, again, the research that we've been doing. So looking at, uh, in this example, this came from an online payments provider. They used data lineage as input to solution design early in an agile project, development sprints. And as a result of using lineage, or having a lineage solution, more than 80% of the information about the data elements used in solutions is now available and consistent across distributed development teams, which has removed a lot of assumptions, improved the quality of solutions delivered in Sprint, and reduced the length of time to value thanks to data lineage. Lineage also provides the teams with the ability to perform impact analysis of proposed changes and develop regression test cases. While a company hasn't qualified the value of lineage, it estimates that data lineage has saved at least one two-week sprint per project. In two weeks of an average eight to 10 developers could be twenty to $40,000 per project, depending on the average salary number of developers. This doesn't include additional time saved through better quality deliverables and fewer break-fix cycles after implementation. This particular case study came to us from a utility company. Prior to having data lineage available through an automated solution, the utility company had employed 15 data stewards. Each were responsible for data in different areas of the business. The company estimated the data stewards spent 30 to 50% of their time in data forensics, responding to business users' requests to know what the data in a report meant and where it came from. Sounds familiar. After implementing an automated data lineage solution, they were able to deploy business user-friendly data lineage dashboards, allowing the business users to answer their own questions. As a result, the amount of time data stewards spent on forensics became negligible. It also resulted in them uncovering some security and compliance issues. Architectural documents and information had not been kept up to date throughout system changes and data warehouse changes and data mark changes and the reports that were being created. As a result, resources couldn't fully comprehend backward where the data come from and forward who was using that lineage. The data lineage that they discovered through the solution helped them help bring the utility back into compliance with both internal and external security policies and get them happy with regulators once again. Looking at a case study that came from a top five U.S. bank, initially the bank required data lineage to assist with data forensic processes and meet federal regulatory audit requirements, including TARP and Basel II. They implemented uh, an automated lineage discovery solution and really got a lot of value out of the lineage itself as they applied it in areas of the business in terms of the forensic and, and audits for concern. They also discovered they could use it at multiple levels of change management and facilitation of application modernization projects, which is a common project camp happening in a lot of large organizations, including banks. They were able to reduce operational risks because of it. They've already been able to decrease the time to market windows of projects and increase the efficiency and transparency of these solutions. The bank's been able to qualify the value of data lineage. It's also been able to quantify the value of automated lineage discovery. Manual tracking of lineage in its complex systems environment was difficult and error prone. Through the implementation of the automated solution, they were able to reduce their efforts by 80 fold. Their detailed analysis showed an approximate $1.1 million savings on discovering the lineage in just 10 key business elements across 100 applications. This is the justification they needed to, they needed to expand the program into more elements and more areas, applications across the business. So what's ahead for data lineage and data supply chain and data intelligence? We're always looking to the future at IDC, so we're going to look here out over over a dock into the lake, into the data lake, if you if you will. Uh, the impact and value of data lineage is, is really not clear. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> is clear based on everything we've all we've already seen. I mean, sorry about that. The complexity of data lineage in the era of digital transformation on the third platform really is driving a lot of innovation and solutions to capture 
manage this data lineage in an automated fashion. Lineage is key components in the ability to deliver higher quality data to the business that is trustworthy, available, secure, and compliant. Zero gap of data lineage is something that's going to become more important as organizations need to see the full picture of the data supply chain. They need to understand every single system component it's gone through, where it came from, and where it's going. Traditionally, filling these gaps outside of uh, data lineage solutions has had to happen manually. There's increasingly automated solutions coming on, out into the market to go into the application source codes, SQL queries, stored procedures, and custom coded solutions to achieve that zero gap lineage. Data lineage is an important part of the data value chain as we've been talking about, and we've been talking about this whole notion of an emerging data intelligence solution, answering the five W's, understanding more about the data. And organizations are gonna begin to learn that big data analysis and insights is not just about the data, but it's also about how the data is being used. And there's a lot of information, there's a lot of insights about that that organizations are starting to uncover. Data intelligence is really going to be used to inform and improve data governance, improve data lifecycle management, assist in making data more secure and compliant, deliver new insights. It's gonna increase the focus on, on instance lineage, the where and how schema lineages lineages have driven many of the solutions to date. But relationship has to come in. In order to look at relationship, you have to go down to the instance level. More needs to be known about where the data for a specific product, customer, service, location, relationship, or other type of master data entity came from, how it's changed, where it is, how it's being used, in order for that to be more trustworthy. All of these trends and Future predictions will help organizations to better understand their own data supply chain and bring more intelligence to the decisions that are being made every day. With that, I will turn it over to Sue. Shannon, if you can give control to her. Great, thank you, Stuart. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, excellent results, and it's definitely on target with what we're experiencing and seeing in the marketplace today. And in this portion of the webinar, um, I'm going to talk more about how data lineage and subscribing to the actual lineage and supply chain increases the effectiveness of your overall data management, compliance, and governance programs. I'm also going to um, hone in on a particular healthcare example and talk a little bit more about how we're seeing um, these use cases in other spectrums of the marketplace, and then go in and touch a little bit on best practices for implementing data lineage. So let's get started with um, looking at that critical supply chain as a foundation to your governance program. So really becoming a true data-centric environment really requires an accurate and precise view on that data lineage supply chain, understanding exactly where the information originated, the quality of the source of that information, and how that information is being reproduced and delivered internally and externally. Um, what we're find, finding primarily in that financial compliance community is that the speed and the accuracy in delivering this traceability is um, exactly the evidence that's needed to support stress testing and audit results. Um, our financial clients as well as the auditors are uh, growing very weary of reproducing this information by deconstructing and reconstructing spreadsheets. And uh, the clients are demanding a, a deeper mining capability uh, that can actually read through the different layers of your code versus simply um, looking at the source to target mappings from an ETL vendor. So um, if you miss a hop in this supply chain, perhaps you miss a column, a calculation, a code, or maybe the lineage stops before reaching its true source, that accuracy of your overall business decision or audit could re result in a demarcation or a financial penalty 
Um, it could expose critical data that could be very harmful or misrepresent your clients or your company in general. And of course, the PII issues are something that we all have to be aware of, as Stuart mentioned before. Um, the data governance tools are doing a great, great job of providing value in that collaboration and the crowdsourcing and forming those consistent definitions across the different communities as well as aligning the, those standards with the policies. But what's in question here is how strong the alignment is to the data standards, um, how, align, sorry, how strong that alignment is to the critical data and the data supply chain. So when you build that strong, comprehensive collection of business assets that really should connect to the similar um, strong, comprehensive results from a data asset perspective. Otherwise, your governance foundation could be sitting on possibly spreadsheets or maybe it's representation of just one project or one line of business across that company. Um, or maybe it was captured from an SME interview. So when that data changes, you need to capture those changes and we're finding clients want this automated and um, they're the, and accurate as well because it's crossing both new and old technology platforms. So this traceability is really bridging the gap on data trust. So let's take it down to a specific healthcare example. Um, and here's a couple insights that I found online. It's not um, representative of a certain client or customer. Um, in the first insight, we see there were 2 million hospital stays um, for patients without insurance. And then the second example here, it says that privately insured parties stayed at least one day less in the hospital than those covered under Medicare. So that's probably a big deal in the, in the um, healthcare world today. And if we break it down and look at the business forensics, we're seeing um, how the length of stay is described within the different lines of business. We also see different types of hospital stays, inpatient stays, outpatient stays, and all the different codes that were involved with these insights like gender codes, region codes, claim codes, and the business rules and policies behind them. So as we're looking in that business zone, we're seeing um, that we start to have questions like, well, how was average length of stay calculated across these various regions? And for that, we need the data forensics, right? We need the data inventory. We need the data lineage to understand the where, when, and how that Stuart mentioned, um, how this information came to be. And it needs to be accurate. And we need this information not only to support the insights, but to act on the insights. So how do we do that? Um, what we're proposing is change detection and subscription to this information. And that first level of forensics, data forensics, is providing you with your high-level data map. This is the where and the how of data lineage at the application level. So when we look at that insight, we can see that the source of the information is coming from the claims database and the patient database and we need to understand the integrity of that particular database. We also see it's um, being, coming from the MDM hub, which is great, right, because that's where all of our validated, certified master data is coming from, so that's a good sign. And the change happened somewhere inside of the enterprise data warehouse where there's a lot of tables being joined, calculations, aggregations happening to produce those results to um, what we're seeing here, the patient claim reports, and of course inside of my big data lake. So when we look at the holistic view from this level, we start to question, okay, are my application owners aware of this change? And what about from a claims processing standpoint? Do they understand the change that was impacted to these individual claim reports? Um, and inside of my big data lake results, um, this could be the possible reason why there was an increase in the length of stay for Medicare patients. So let's take another look, a deeper look, at the actual change in what took place here in this example. So level two is the detailed information, and what we found here is that a SQL override was introduced in April, and this override joined two entirely different columns. 
Um, the length of stay for private claims that were set to yes used procedure start and end date versus what they were calculating off of before, which was the hospital check-in and check-out date for Region 14 in the UK. So, by the way, I did this before Brexit, so I'm not trying to make any predictive healthcare insights. Um, but the local change request performed within the EDW affected the entire data supply chain for claims and big data insights. And when you start to investigate data causation and correlation, you start to find out that um, the inclusion of this SQL override actually shaved off one full day from, of that Medicare patient stay on the final global insight and what was reported out through um, the BI reporting area. So the question is, how quickly can you pinpoint and detect these changes yourself? How, do you, how easy is it for you to look across regions, look across departments, different technologies, the ETL code and the calculations? That one particular change could have been in paragraphs and paragraphs of PLSQL, um, Java or JSP code or maybe all those different codes. Um, so you really need ch change detection at that really deep um, code analysis standpoint. So yes, quick and accurate data res results or data traces are paramount in resolving these issues. However, we feel the evolution is towards detecting these cross-platform changes before they happen by using subscription and workflow processes to guide your BI and risk analysts through um, these changes before they hit production. So when you're looking at data lineage tools, um, you might want to look at uh, whether the lineage is also supported in a work and process area um, so you can understand that 2B state before it goes into production and understand um, you might want to look at um, lines of business workflows, so making it easier for those different lines of business to submit their lineage before it goes into production and creating that enterprise view. And then, of course, that code analysis um, being built into your lineage connections to make sure that all the hops are represented regardless of how that data is being moved. Finally, I wanted to talk real quick about just some other use cases that we've experienced. And um, when you combine support for compliance, data assurance, data quality, and data insights, you start to see a much more uh, broadened, broadened use case across different market se segments. And I'm going to, for time's sake, skip some of the ones that we've already talked about and jump to um, from a retail perspective. In one scenario uh, we saw where providing data lineage actually reduced data delays from weeks to days for seasonal campaigns where they needed to make quick changes to web services that were producing information in online marketing and promotions. Um, lineage is serving pharma clients really well by ensuring them um, that key data sets are monitored via the supply chain lineage and validated for treatment patterns and drug testing outcomes. Um, they, they use lineage to connect analysts to experts to further their knowledge and insights um, through the lineage. And then from a manufacturing standpoint, um, we've seen the case where product directories and codes failed to connect the MDM hubs to that where lineage, leaving only half the picture. Um, they couldn't pinpoint the source system and subsequently the incorrect codes were being used um, in their transform and calculation logic. And these incorrect codes recorded the expenses to the wrong cost center, which really misrepresented the overall um, product revenue. And I'm sorry, I have a poll here that I didn't read. Um, do you have resources managing BI lineage supply chains in your organizations today? Uh, pick one, yes or no. And then if you could also let us know what industry um, you're in, whether it's finance, retail, healthcare, pharma, manufacturing, or entertainment, that would be great too. And Shannon, I see that I am almost running out of time. We're getting close, but uh, people are answering the poll. And if you want to throw your uh, industry into the chat section, uh, the poll is just closing in four seconds. <laughs> All right, perfect. And I see some comments coming into the chat and find lots of finance on the phone. That's great. <laughs> All right. 
automotive insurance, <laughs> more finance. All right, and here are the poll results. Okay. I think um, we'll refer back to these maybe at the end because I just want to finish at least one more slide before we get to the questions and that answers, if that's okay. All right. So let's end on, and how come it's not moving forward? There we go. So let's end on best practices around implementing data lineage. So. Um, we know that uh, there's some things that you might want to consider, be, consider before you go about implementing data lineage. Um, it, w from a software perspective, we've worked at simplifying this process and the pull of information, and from a best practices standpoint, we've worked at um, how we go about scoping and implementing this particular data lineage projects. And we start with identifying the critical data. So um, what we usually do interviews and work with SMEs to identify where you're most at risk as an organization um, with not governing particular pieces of data. And then we also look at um, working backwards, doing some reverse um, scoping on the actual critical data that you're distributing um, within and throughout your organization and understand um, what that chain is, and we usually ask you for a baseline because that baseline becomes very handy when you're talking about return on investment later on um, as you start to prove out that lineage. What might take you, you know, 60 to 90 days for your initial implementation of data lineage um, versus, you know, months and months of collecting this information um, for a one-time pull is, is really significant in keeping that um, lineage project on track. And then we go at the automation, we point our scanners at collecting this information, and in parallel you can be collecting your business glossary information, your traceability, and um, connecting the trace business traceability to how it's re represented in the physical world. And from an ongoing standpoint, uh, we're getting a lot of traction with our end users who want to monitor and subscribe to change detection going forward. All right, so finally, one last slide. Um, at, here at ASG, we've pulled together, together our lineage experts to provide some pretty great new features in our latest data intelligence release. And um, this latest release includes things like snapshots, so being able to pro provide point-in-time history of when data was created and where it was created and how it moved and where it was distributed. Um, also providing issue tracking and feedback mechanisms right on the lineage itself. Um, inserting our lineage into other areas of technologies in your technology ecosystem. Um, a line of business workflow, which I already talked about, and of course subscribing to that lineage um, through notifications and workflows. So I'm going to stop right there, Shannon, and turn it back to you for questions and answers. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Stuart, for these great presentations. Uh, we certainly have questions coming in. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section. And, of course, one of the most popular questions we receive are people asking about the slides and the recording. I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Thursday with links to both of those and any additional information requested throughout. Um, you know, uh, Sue, uh, I think this, this is specifically for you. Uh, I, I, this person said they joined late and weren't sure if you answered this already, and I don't know that you did. Do you have any um, automated alerts for data lineage changes transpiring upstream of the EDW and downstream application impacts? Yes, we definitely do. So our automated alerts are going through email system to notify um, subscribers that a change was um, impacted anywhere along that data lineage supply chain. Thank you. And again, uh, to you, Sue, it appears to me that you're suggesting maybe a bureaucratic process, which might bog down the uh, entire process. How is it not um, doing that? Um, I think that the bureaucratic process is, is more in establishing standards um, from a policy and a, and a business definition standpoint. The automation of the lineage is really coming based off of 
um, scanners that port that information into the repository and create that, that linkage for you automatically versus um, running anything through a workflow process. Uh, I think maybe where that question comes from is that work in process area, so understanding the 2B state before promoting it to, into production, and that's a step that um, is really up to you if you want to um, seek out and provide. You can make those changes straight to production or you can work in a preventative manner and ensure that the changes that you make um, don't impact other areas before pushing it in, into production, but that's your choice. Sure, makes sense. Uh, next question coming in, uh, what applications are you using, utilizing for data management, data lineage? Is that for Stuart in his poll or? Probably both to, to both of you. Okay. Um, from, from our standpoint, we'll work with any sort of package. Um, we've worked with other data governance packages as well as BI end user reporting packages. Um, so anywhere where you see the need to see that source to target information and how the data is flowing and trace through it, um, we can port our information into that using a REST API. Yeah, I think getting back to the, the whole zero gap data lineage idea, I mean, it's, it's important to have an understanding where your data is regardless of what application it's sitting in and how that data is flowing through the organization. Typically. You know, if you're, if you're putting the data into a, into a warehouse or, or into a Hadoop data repository or something in order to build a dashboard over it, in order to, to, to track uh, KPIs and such, um, you know, it's important to, to understand that it's not just those applications, the data that you're looking at in there that you need to understand where it came from, but even, you know, it's good to understand how the data flows through an application itself, and that's really where um, you know the REST API that Sue referred to, and, and you're seeing a lot of a lot of the, the data lineage software solution providers starting to offer that kind of capability, and starting to look at um, or push into the application codes itself, and looking at the SQL and and uh, um, you know um, intersecting the SQL in the network and being able to understand. As, as that data is flowing around the organization. Hopefully that right. answered the question. I believe so, and certainly they can, um, the questioner can, can ask more um, specifics if needed. And do you monitor, again to both of you, do you monitor all of your data with your ETL processing or just choose the most critical data sets? Oh, that's a so, great question. So um, I think it's both. We like to start with critical data, but also your critical data sets, I think, is another great avenue to start with, and, and they could be the same in most cases. But um, starting with your critical data allows you to, to narrow down your priorities and ensure that you're attacking, you know, those areas that's going to provide you the best overall value um, of your program and see some really great results right away. Yeah, I would agree. I've seen I've seen organizations that have gone against starting with their critical master data to understand the lineage of it and understand its supply chain, uh, and been so successful with it in one domain of master data that they quickly started to uh, expand the program into other other domains. And in some cases, they're now looking at uh, expanding that even further into the transactional data. Uh, uh, the, the next question is, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it's, it's going to, it's certainly going to vary from environment to environment, but maybe Stuart, you want to start here uh, answering on this question. How large is your their uh, EDW? Ours is 200 terabytes in production. Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> again, that's, uh, in, our, in the survey that we did, we did not ask about size of data warehouse. Uh, there certainly are multiple different sizes. It's kind of an it depends answer depending on how much data you're actually tracking. Um, you know, uh, there are some organizations that I've worked with that have data warehouses and have data environments larger than that. And there's others that I've worked with that are smaller. Um, you know, when you, and when you've got that amount of data, you've really got to kind of back to the last question. You've really got to pick and choose where, what you're going to start with. 
look at your more critical data elements and your more critical data sets. But the data that you need to have the highest level of trust in to support strategic or operational business decisions, that's the data you want to go after, and that's the data you want to understand the best, the most about. Uh, Sue, I don't know, um, you've, you've worked with probably more customers in terms of specific data lineage applications. Do you have an idea of the size of data warehouses or data repositories that, that they're handling and managing? Um, they're they're usually quite large. Um, we've worked with some that have had over over you know 50 to 70 source systems that are feeding those data warehouses and going out to several different um, reporting marts and into that big data lake. So the environments can be quite large. And, and from our perspective, um, we're capturing the metadata, so we're not capturing the data. But understanding all the relationships and the links in and out of the data warehouse is very important. And um, a lot of these financial institutions are global implementations, so um, the data can get quite massive. But again, we're looking at the schema of the information versus the data in most cases. Lovely. And again, the, uh, and question to both of you: Did they did you prototype various data lineage tools, and which did you ax and for what specific reasons? Uh, so I'll. I'll take that uh, in, in the research that we did, we did not look at any specific data lineage tools. Um, it was really a, try, uh, we wrote a paper recently trying to understand the value that data lineage was providing. We didn't go specifically in its, into tools and did any, we didn't do any, uh, any comprehensive evaluation of the tool sets. Sure. And so, uh, uh, and well, to both of you, I don't know if you have this on handy or, or maybe we can include it in the follow-up, but um, the, the inquiry is that seeing the impact in a graphical fashion for a change at source, assuming the pipeline is complicated, uh, data federation environment. Um, okay, I think the question is um, how easy is it to see the impact of the change in, in a real busy environment? And um, definitely there's different ways that you can zoom in and zoom out on the information. And we always feel that it's better to start from an app-to-app -app level first. Um, so kind of describing the flow of the information from an application perspective and allowing the end user to drill further into the information. So as they drill, um, it's important to have some online graphics that provide a trace. And uh, with our technology, you can hone in on a particular um, critical data element and say trace, and it will draw a red line around the um, feeds and around the seed item and where it's going to. So absolutely correct. Um, sometimes uh, getting through the spaghetti is not easy, and there should be some good graphics, and it should be dynamic for the end user to control and um, zoom in and zoom out on. And so uh, does ASG support lineage for hybrid data warehouse implementation comprising of Hadoop and uh, relational databases? Yes, we do. Um, I love that. Uh, That's a quick, easy, <laughs> quick answer. <laughs> um, you know, and the final question coming in here, and again, maybe this is something we can add in the follow-up email. Uh, the questioner wants to know where they can find more about this topic. And maybe to so, both of you. Yeah. Stuart, I think this is a great time to talk about that white paper. Yeah. So, um, uh, ASG will be uh, providing, or uh, the, e the email that goes out, I believe, after this um, will give you links to a white paper that that I have written at IDC based on the research that I did looking at the impact and value of data lineage. You'll see uh, some of the, the content from the webinar today in that white paper, uh, but you'll see a lot more than that. Um, and you'll be able to, to grab that from the ASG website. And obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on in data lineage, um, metadata management. We're certainly tracking the market, uh, so we've got additional material in terms of uh, market sizing and forecasting that sort of thing. But uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot going on 
uh, whether you, you know you especially want to look at net lineage or you want to look at the broader topic of metadata management, you want to start to look at data intelligence solutions. Uh, I'm sure that a uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of different things that are going on out there. I know certainly when I was doing my research, my my queries, my internet searches uh, ended up giving me a lot of things to look at. So, um, and in, and in addition to that, I'm sure there's lots of additional. There is I know there's lots of additional material on the ASG website. I love it. And that brings us right to the top of the hour. Again, Sue and Stuart, thank you so much for this great presentation. And thanks, as always, to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just appreciate all the great questions you submit um, and engage in conversation. Uh, again, just a reminder, I sent a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, the recording of this information, of this webinar, and um, the white paper that Stuart just mentioned. And thanks again, and I hope everyone has a great day. And thanks, ASG, for sponsoring today's webinar. Our pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you very much, thanks. Sue.